Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael Siggins, and I am the of Channel Pro Magazine. I want to add a special thank you to all of our attendees and our panelists today. Just for our webinar entitled Break Fix Today, Manage Services Tomorrow. We're going to provide an overview of the services that we all know, the ones we've and the ones that are coming in 2012 and beyond. Much like the guest today is Mike Byrne, VP of MSP over at Quest Software. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. And before we uh, get going, I am going to just cover a couple of housekeeping slides for all of our participants today and our, our attendees. First of all, how to participate for audio options. Please make sure the volume of your computer is on. And then to join the audio broadcast during the event, you can choose Join Audio Broadcasting up on the Communicate menu up in the blue nav bar. And then down to our teleconference line if you want, and that's 1-408-792-6300. And be sure to use that meeting number there that you see on bullet number two. If you have any difficulty at all with WebEx, our platform, Form, please contact their technical support at 866-229-239. We need to participate. That's what makes these webinars so great. And uh, if you want to ask any questions of the panelists, that's really uh, my mic. You can submit your questions via the Q&A area down at the lower right of the screen. If you have any technical issues, then there's a chat window right above Q&A in the middle right. Right. And make sure you submit your questions to the host, EH Publishing. And Lauren, behind the scenes, will try to take care of any of those issues for you. But if you're having difficulty with the WebEx platform itself, again, please contact them at 866-229-3239. And we are recording this today, so it will be available on demand later. All right. Now, without further ado, I'm going to pass us off to Mike Byrne. Mike, please take it away. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think the best way to start today's webinar off would be to sort of give everyone a bit of a background as to where I personally come from, which I think and hope will wrap a little context around today's uh, webinar session and hopefully give you the value that you're looking for. Because I know, as we all know, that you know you guys have taken time out of your busy schedule, so we want to maximize the time for you guys. So again, thanks for coming, and a little bit about Mike Byrne. So uh, essentially. I've spent the last 18, 19 years in software sales specifically, but um, in managed services, I started about eight and a half years ago at a company up in Ottawa, just another uh, managed service software vendor, and I sold software, I sold the platform to folks like yourselves on the phone, and then I had the luxury of moving on to a different team that was developed way back in the day, I believe it was 2004, it was a channel team where I got to spend a week a month in market working with folks like yourself yourself, helping guys sell your services to your end users. So I sort of walked that mile for a little over three years, so I completely understand a lot of the challenges that you guys face from an organizational standpoint, to a sales standpoint, to a marketing standpoint, as well as it's no secret that there's a challenge, you know, when you're looking for the right tools to fit, you know, the go-to-market plan that you guys want to execute on, and sort of just round out your tool set. So... We really appreciate the challenges you guys have gone through to get where you are currently. And hopefully this presentation will give you guys a little bit of assistance in areas that you might need or you might not need. So without any further ado, I'll sort of slide through. This slide here is kind of interesting. That's the head office in Quest uh, down in Lisa Viejo. And what you can't see is that just off to the right, that big aquarium, that's actually like a 30 foot by 15 foot high by 8 foot wide aquarium. It's actually rather impressive. It's a little light note, <laughs> but um, as for Quest, a lot of people in the SMB slash MSP managed services industry aren't really super aware of Quest, um, and I wasn't myself prior to them acquiring Packet Trap Networks, the company I was working for uh, just over three years ago. But Quest also owns Script Logic, which is another company that deals more in our space that we all know as home down in the sub 250 seat, real sub 100 seat small business space. But um, Quest primarily deals with large enterprise and mid enterprise companies, but they're really coming downstream heavily. And I think you know they've proven that by you know their acquisition of Script Logic, I think it was five years ago, as well as they acquired us, and they're coming downstream even further. And and else I'll talk about in this presentation is uh, Blue Folder, which is our PSA tool that we've purchased and bundled into our product. But Quest as a whole, 
um, has a pretty broad reach with 60 offices around the planet. And the number that you're seeing on the screen right now with 3,600 employees is a little older. Uh, I think it's close to the 4,300. But so that's I thought you know I'd give you guys a bit of a background as to who Quest is, but more importantly, why is it important for you guys for me to you know sort of blither on about who Quest is? Because well, as an MSP, you're dealing with you know keeping the the lights on, keeping the, the your employees paid, you know keeping your clients up and running, and from that perspective, like it's no secret you guys get inundated with phone calls from software vendors like us, but. Um, a phone call from someone like us might be important for you would be you look at the broad scale of how you guys organically got to where you are right now. Some of you guys came from selling hardware. Some of you folks came from, you know, large companies where you manage the internal IT shop and who knows, there's a million different tributaries you guys have taken to get where you are. But one of the cool solution choices that we feel is pretty stored from our perspective in terms of helping you guys grow is, you know, one of the values that Quest brings to the table is, um, especially with the Packet Trap uh, Networks acquisition primarily is what I'm referring to. So if you look at the folks on, on the left of the screen, these are the, you know, the managed service remote monitoring software vendors that most of, most of you guys are accustomed to. I came from Enable Technologies down on the bottom. And I've been with the company now for a little over almost four years now. Um, but here's here's the dynamic. So if you look at the people on the left, the right hand side of the screen, these are companies that, that you know the amazing platforms, but the huge, huge, huge platforms. And I'd almost put solar winds in that bucket too, um, where they primarily deal with a much larger demographic than what you guys do. Um, and then you look at the folks on the, the right-hand side of the screen. These are all the folks, and now Zenith obviously has a rebrand. We all know it's Continuum. Uh, this slide deck needs to be updated there. But these folks here, they're all great companies, good folks, good products. But one of the values that, that we're going to bring to the table is we're as nimble as the rest of the folks on the left-hand side of the screen, we're not as complicated and convoluted to use and way cheaper than the folks on the right-hand side of the screen, but we're also backed by the 30th uh, largest software company on Earth. So um, I think that's as, about as much of a, a pitch I will do for the product side before I get into the meat and potatoes as to why you all joined the, the webinar this morning. So uh, one of the interesting points that I do want to make mention, which does dovetail really nicely into to where I'm going with this as a segue is from our perspective, we understand fully that, you know, Zenith was on to something some years ago when they wrapped everything into one offering where they had their their monitoring tool and they, they didn't have a PSA, like a ticketing system like ConnectWise, Autotask or Topaw, but, you know, they had integration uh, paths with all of those vendors as well. But they had a really solid help desk and they had uh, a I don't know what they resold for AV, but I know they had a bunch of different applications that they integrated with. Whereas from our perspective, we wrapped everything into one cool package, and everything's accessed from one screen. So from a single brand and a single solution, you can access everything you need to move forward. Okay, now we're getting into the reason why, you know, some of you guys, from a break-fix perspective, may be challenging. You may be going through some challenges in terms of how you're delivering your services. Some of you folks that are delivering proactive for fully managed services, you know, you may have gone through your challenges, but you understand what the competition is doing. And in our setting, it's easy for me just to continue talking and sort of highlight these factors. But where, from a production standpoint, if I was doing this from a live presentation perspective, I would say, you know, by a show of hands, how many people are still doing break fix and how, by a show of hands, how many are selling contracted services. But in absence of that dynamic, you know, it's important for, from your perspectives, because my understanding is you guys are all, you know, IT support slash MSP slash VARs bringing in services and value to your small business clients. Now, it's no secret that, that you know, the dynamic right now is like Best Buy has a Geek Squad, Ingram Micro, Ingram Micro has Seismic. Uh, HP has their offering. Dell, we all know they acquired Silverback back in the day. And then you have the Comcast, Verizon, and at and with their – they're not looking at managed services per se, but they're offering backup. They're offering different types of services, which, you know, can help and hinder you guys, um, depending on how your go-to-market is. But one of the key things that really separates you guys from the pack is you're at the street level. There's no fear. From from your client's perspective, that you're going, you know, you're just a, a 
or just a faceless name on a on a client list from one of the the big ones that we see on, on the, top, the the far right and the bottom of the screen. Like you guys have the relationship, and you guys have that you know that trust as as a trusted advisor as the boots on the ground when the server goes south. So it's interesting from that perspective. Um, Microsoft has been able to sort of wiggle themselves in, but they've never been able to sort of crack the nut that the panel you guys have been able to do. So <clears throat> it's interesting, and I think you guys still have a really strong, firm grip on the, the sub-100 seat small business space. But it, 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 I would say it would... It would be in your best, adva- you know, best interest to make sure you're aware of what what's going on peripherally with the larger folks because they're always hovering out there, and you know sometimes you can pick up some good marketing tips from them um, because there's no secret they have endless pockets when it comes to radio, TV, you know, newspaper ads, print ads, web ads, um, and you know a couple hours spent surfing some of their. Their offerings online could give you and your marketing department some brilliant ideas that you can sort of concoct, mix around, and regurgitate into your own go-to-market plans. But um, it's always interesting to be aware of what's going on. One of the other differences that separates you guys from the other folks is the challenges you face versus what they face. They just throw money at a marketing plan, whereas from your perspective, it's you know, helping list. It's trying to figure out what your clients want. It's trying to say, wow, okay, I got, you know, a whole slew of clients. Not all of them react the same way if the server's unplugged. So their maturity and sensitivity to downtime and dependency on the network varies from client to client. You know, so perspective, do your SLAs or your service offerings, your programs, whatever you want to call them, do they really meet the needs of all of your clients? Is it a one size fits all? Like, you know, how are you going to develop the scalable and flexible services that your clients need um, will be met as well as you can deliver on? So there's a lot of challenges that, you know, for a lot of a lot of you that have already gone through those growing pains of experience, uh, for those that haven't, you know, these are some of the the roadblocks, not roadblocks, but the challenges awaiting you down the road. Uh, another key thing is how do you differentiate your servings from your competitor? So you could have, and you know, I think you know, bronze, silver, gold, the precious metals moniker has been hammered to death in terms of you know your SLAs. But you know, we all know they back into bronze, silver, gold, or reactive, proactive, and fixed fee, or whatever you want to call them. But you know, if you look at most of your competitors' websites, and I'm talking, you know, the sub 25 seats. MSPs. If you look at their websites, the vast majority don't have a lot of meat within their managed services, you know, icon on their website. So go to that landing page, it talks a little bit about time, a little bit about proactive monitoring, and then it just got into the same stuff everyone else is talking about. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on a few slides from now talking about how to change that. Not necessarily in rebranding your website, but you know, becoming more audible ready with the appropriate tracks for when you're in front of your folks. Because, you know, from my perspective, it was really easy to me to fly into, and I had the Mid-Atlantic as a territory. So I sort of worked with folks from Maryland down to Atlanta, well, Georgia, I should say. So it was easy for me to fly in one week a month and work with two or three of you guys. And I had no quota over my head. I had no strategy attached. So I did have that traditional sales fear that we all feel when we're going in on a closing call or we're going in on a call or whatever. So I could just so shoot from the hip and just be myself. And it was really easy. Um, but I worked with a lot of great MSPs and I worked with a lot of MSPs who struggled with sales. So, you know, determining what service offering is going to meet all of the different types of clients you have and all their needs and, and you know, staying away from the commodity trap of selling a entry monitoring only type of service is, is, is problematic. You know, those are some of the other challenges, some challenges that you really need to do once you've figured out that, yeah, okay, those are some of the hurdles we've gotten over, we've figured out, and we have a game plan. What do I need to do to really get going? Well, you have to develop a go-to-market plan. And oddly enough, grown organically from when the phone rings, you're employed, meaning, you know, Acme Trucking has a server failure. So then, you know, you hit the, the bat cave and away you go. If you've organically grown that way, developing a managed services plan is just the next step. 
But you've grown organically where you're selling hardware or software or you've just been doing projects all the time. It's, it's a fundamental shift. It's not possible, but it requires you really got to hammer it out. And you sort of detail that whole knock operational process because the smaller folks and the folks who have grown from just the break fix arena, their operational process all you have to do is insert some automation and away they go. But you guys, you guys got to develop the entire strings and lines of communication and what happens when this alert goes, who's, you know what I mean? So there's that whole dynamic that you got to flush out, which is a layer that the other smaller guys have already got. So, you know, once you figure out what you need to do, and the easiest way to do that is to do like a SWAT. What are my strengths? What are my, what are my opportunities? And then what are my threats? And once you get through that SWAT matrix, and it's really easy to do. You know, you'll have a much better understanding of what what elements you're missing, what elements you have, and then when you know kneeling them together, that is going to work really well when you flush out that entire plan. Because some of the areas that folks don't factor in would be just that knock operational process. Like if Acme phones and they're paying me 800 bucks a month, what's next? Who goes where? Who has priority? And just figuring out all of the the you know connection points. Um, who to hire? Are my salespeople going to sell exclu- exclusively managed services, or am I going to give them a whole host of things that they can sell? And I'll touch on that later because I have some pretty strong opinions. But um, I want to get through this one slide here. But you know, some of the biggest challenges I've seen, and one of the most commonly asked questions that I've got hit with on every trade show that I've ever done a keynote on would be, you know, how do I price this? Um, you know, what do I put in? Do I just resell the tool that I'm using? Like, how do I figure this out? You know, how do I market? Those are some of the key questions that I've been asked. But probably the most important question that I've been asked all the time would be, how much do I charge and how should I charge them? And what I mean by how should I charge for my services is, should I be charging per device or should I be charging holistic or per end user or what have you? And I will get to those in a couple of slides. But this is what everything should be layered on top of. So take a, a typical small business that is, is getting about a million a year, or sorry, is, is getting about a million a year in recurring revenue. So if we use the 2,000 hour, 2000 hour rule, we know that that small business, and we'll call it Acme Trucking, okay, because I'm using that analogy for like years now, so, or eight years. Acme Trucking is a million dollars a year and everything's going great and you guys are all their MSP, right? So it's one big company. So what ends up happening is things are going along and all of a sudden, boom, 45 one morning, the server fails. So when everyone shows up to work, they pull Hank out of shipping because he runs the dispatch desk, but Hank's also the resident online gaming specialist. So he wears the help desk hat because they like phoning you guys because they know you're going to charge them 150 bucks an hour. So if they can get Hank, who they've already you know, he's on their payroll to fix it. They're giving themselves what, one fifty to three hundred bucks an hour. So, you know, Hank doesn't know what's going on. So at eight fifty two, Hank hangs up his hat and says, "This is beyond me." They phone you guys. Now, on a good day, you're ready to go, but you guys don't have the luxury of having five people on the bench waiting for their phone call, right? So, you know. On a perfect day, after lunch, you can send your you know, top engineer, Mary, out. But typically, Mary's on another call. So Mary's only getting the next business thing unless you yourself go, and well, no, that's the reality, right? So what ends up happening is Mary arrives at 134, and the only information Mary has is, you know, no one can do anything. The server, the lights are blinking, and there's a big blue screen. She doesn't know anything. So she's got to troubleshoot, charge, and then diagnose, and then remediate the problem. That's going to take like two to three hours, right? Minimum. So what ends up happening at that point is you get a huge invoice. Now, if they were on an LA and you had automation in place where you were monitoring them, you know, the instant that server failed, you'd get an alert. So this as to whether you have a reactive, a proactive, or a fixed fee type of engagement, because we all know the the mediation process is going to differ, and your engagement is going to differ if you have a basic program in place versus a fixed fee, right? But for the sake of this, I'm just going to say, you know, you phone at 8 o'clock and you say, hey, hey uh, 
Gus, you know, Acme Trucking, we know your server's down. Tell Hank to stay in the shipping department. We know exactly what to do. You know, if it's a reactive program, you'd probably say, hey, look, we can log online and fix it remotely, or I could have Mary over there shortly because you're in our priority of service queue. And uh, rather than us charging 150 bucks an hour because you're one of our preferred clients, we're charging, you know, you got that preferred rate of one nineteen eighty five. So boom, away we go. Do you want us to do it now? In a in a proactive service offering, if you had built in reactive support hours, you just hit hit it, fix it, and let them know anyways. Or next fee, you know, you're on the hook anyways. So that's the whole cycle, right? So if as a break fix service provider, if you're not looking at that as a reality, you know, you're really looking at what you're saving your clients as well. So. It's something you really have to factor in because if you look at the total time saved, if you look at their time, and I'm not even going to get into the how many people work at Acme versus their HR cost versus how what percentage of productivity was lost and all that. This is just solid hard cost. So you know, from a soft cost and a sales perspective, like that cost would be exponentially larger. And that's something that you guys have to be audible ready with when you you're printing a, a solution to an uh, to a small business owner, but this is a really cool slide that lets you guys hopefully, you know, see the delta between what's happening on your clients' environments if you're not managing them properly with an SLA versus break fix. Things which segues really nicely from that slide is I don't know about you guys, but. If you're delivering break fix services, I look at that and a lot of other people look at that in the space. And Gary Peek and I, if, if you guys are familiar with Gary Peek, he was an extremely successful MSP who then branched out and opened up his own consulting firm, Method. Great, I love Gary. I've known Gary for years. Him and I one time were at a trade show where we were sort of bantering back and forth about an analogy of how to sort of convey the difference between break fix and uh, like MSP is delivering fixed. And I said, well, it's like finding it, their business needs. So if I was a financial advisor and I was a break fix guy, I'd be making money when all my clients are losing money. And just sort of laughed and we went on and we just hit it. And we both have been pitching it on every trade show we, we talk about, but it's true. If, if, if delivering break fix services and you have SLAs in place, you're getting paid when your clients' networks are experiencing downtime, right? So if you're a, uh, a managed service provider and you have your clients under a managed service SLA engagement where apart from reactive because reactive you're really just reducing the amount of downtime you're not preventing downtime right? you're just monitoring for failure um, but you have to align your business needs so I, I want personally my financial advisor to be making money I'm making money and for he or he to be losing money if I'm losing money so it's something that, that sales perspective if you're you're talking to one of your clients and you're talking to them about, you know, why you'd like to move them from the, the traditional historical service support model that you've been supporting them under to this new fandang, fandangled managed service contract or whatever bumper sticker you want to put on your services. I would use that example. But as it stands right now, I love cashing your checks. I really do. You know, I don't want to jeopardize cashing your checks whenever you have a network failure because I want to be your guy. Wow. Well, you know, just like the mechanic, you know, the mechanic loves it when your car breaks down because they bill in you 60 to 120 bucks an hour. Great. But my new services, you're going to pay me a little bit on a monthly basis, uh, whatever the money is, whatever you, you sort of give them the spread of what your services are. You know, rather you paying me monthly for me to ensure that you're up. So you're making money and I'm making money and our business alignment is right on track. So that segues right from the last slide where – if you look at what traditionally happens versus what would happen if you were monitoring them, monitoring them under an SLA versus the business needs alignment, it makes a lot of sense. Perspective, you know, services, we all know why everyone wants to get into managed services, right? So you want to get an increased revenue, you know, recurring revenue. So it's one thing to say, you know, and I've spoke to, of MSPs over the last eight and a half years, and some are doing super successfully well, um, some are doing okay, some are struggling, but at the end of the day, when it comes to recurring revenue, when people throw numbers on a monthly basis when I've been talking to them, and the first thing I do is I quantify the numbers. I say, okay, well, what, what's your services revenue? Meaning, like, how much contract 
expected revenue are you generating on a monthly basis? Because at the end of the day, if I was going to buy your company or Charlie or Mary's company, what I'd want to do, if, if, I, if I had $3 million to spend and I were going to buy one company, I'd make sure the company I purchased, you know, they, if they all had a million in recurring revenue, I'd buy the company that had a million on contract. I wouldn't take a million in project labor. I wouldn't take a million in break fix labor over a million in contracted revenue. So from a business valuation standpoint, it's secret that um, if anyone in on webinars uh, familiar with David Schaffron out of New York, he does uh, transformation strategies, and he also has a company that helps service providers get into the acquisition space, the M&A space, where, whether they want to sell or buy. And I was talking to David last year, and from a business valuation standpoint, it's critical for you guys to have recurring revenue. So suggesting that you have to get into managed services because you want to get into the M&A game, but I'm saying everyone has an exit, right? Everyone is on that wheel because you want to get off the wheel at some point. So if you want to get off the wheel and land in a big pile of fluffy cash, from your perspective, you want to increase your evaluation. And further that point, and this is why I wanted to sort of go down this path right here at this point in this juncture, I should say, in this slide deck, is because this is what you guys do, right? There's a secret, what you're looking at on the screen right in front of you, apart from projects and some of the other you know, uh, factors that you bring to the table, this is what you do, right? So break fix, that's what you're doing. I, I think, and I got the numbers on the bottom, so if everyone sort of looks down at the bottom and you're looking at average per user pricing and all this, um, the bi typical business valuation, that's from Gartner. So Gartner says if you have no contract revenue, your business valuation is zero. So what that really means is if you're making a hundred grand, um, you know, you're going to probably sell your company from anything from 75 to 120 or whatever. But I don't necessarily agree with that because I know and I've seen companies get acquired with no break with no with a hefty managed services component. Because your book of business is what's really going to drive it, but we're going to drive it to revs that you want where your retirement is either, you know, you get to add a deck on the back of your place or you get to add a dock on, you know, in Bahamas, who knows. But if you look at reactive, proactive and fixed fee, um, this is what I get asked all the time. How much do I charge? How much da 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 da? And I hate giving that. There is an average, and the average is in front of you guys on the screen. I give price pricing because I can't count how many times I've been on a sales call with one of you guys, and the person whom I was working with, when asked by the client, so how much are the services? And they say, well, it's about 18 bucks a desktop or whatever the price is. And it's X per server and X per whatever. And you could almost sit back and watch it. I go one, two, three, boom. And it's almost like a drum roll. And then they, they do the mental math. They pull the devices and they go, wow. Okay, can we do where we take out some of the desktops and only two of the four servers? And you get into that quire of sort of justifying and you either lower your price and lower your integrity, or you take devices off the grid, or you have the deeper dive and explain to them why you can't do that. Whereas, if you go at them from a holistic pricing perspective, meaning, well, Bob, our bronze typically starts at around X, but then we do is we customize it based on, you know, once we drill through more of what you're really looking for, or you say, well, typically, you know, our bronze starts at, you know, you know, 10 bucks or 20 bucks a user, whatever the price is, you know, and in the three and a half years I was doing channel, I only had two people say, well, can we take some people off the grid? And because they were trying to save that per person cost. And the, the comeback shuts the whole door on that argument immediately. You can say, well, I'd love to be able to save you some money, but we might be able to look at it in a different area because if we take people off the grid, that person could be the person infecting the rest of the network. And if they're out of our scope of management, plus am I not to take a call if they phone in and say, hey, I can't access X is kind of a tricky situation. So, you know, it's one of those easy, easy, easy rebuttals, and it just it's light years ahead of the per-device pricing model. So I won't be with that slide much more. Um, I'm going to about a couple points here which are really, really, really important. And I think this is one of those where I'm sort of segueing back and tying a loop, closing loop from what I was speaking with, uh, talking about before. If you let give one step of con, uh, one little bit of context. One of the biggest questions or pushbacks I've had is, well, I don't want to trade my 
I break for revenue because I'm making good money for managed service revenue. It's like taking from Peter to pay Paul, or it's, it's equal. And, uh, no, it's not. It's totally not equal. Because if you look at what your clients are spending on a monthly basis, that's predicated 100% on active environment. In other words, you're always reacting. Sometimes you may go in and do something proactively, or if you're there, you're, you or your engineer, you know, they're doing the honey-do list when they hit the door for whatever reason. So half the stuff you're not being, you're not billing for, and you're emerging revenue and labor revenue, and, and not a true, true apples-to-apples comparison. So if you look at the whole break-fix environment, you, if you're generating 500 bucks a month off a client and you think that's great money, or if a block in place, just think of how quickly you can draw it down upon that block if you have real metrics. If you can go to that business owner and say, hey, look, just so you know, here's what's happening with your patching, here's what's happening with your last restore, here's what's happening with the domain, here's what's happening with the staff productivity on Facebook, da, 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 da. oh, here, four of those you know, six servers are almost at capacity, and here's all the metrics. So you're flushing out constant project-based labor, which you can take to the bank. So I am I would never be advocate of just, you know, deploy the software and use the monitoring metrics to generate extra revenue. But my point is if you deploy any type of SA with all of your clients, you have access unless you're in a fixed fee, because fixed fee you're just on the hook for everything. So but a proactive there's a cap, in a reactive obviously there's a cap. From that perspective, you're looking at increasing your project base, your sales based revenue by forty percent points. So if you're generating 500 bucks a month on someone and you sell them your bronze, let's say, at you know, 299 a month or what have you, a user, you're going to generate whatever that monthly nut is, you're going to generate 40 points on top of that based on what revenue you can generate out of that. And you're being more proactive. You're giving, you're giving your client base time to react, time to budget, time to plan. So, you know, as it stands right now, what's happening is this goes back to business alignment. Are, are your go-to-market support methodologies in line with your clients? If it stands right now, you may tell your, your clients every now and then, oh, you better upgrade that server. And you a few more times, and then six months later, boom, the server goes south. They're down for two days. they got to spend another X on servers. And it's a big quagmire, and it costs them a lot of money. And I'm not if you guys are aware of this or not, but that's their biggest complaint about you guys. Like, we spend, our marketing department spends countless hours interviewing your base because we want that information to feed it to you guys. And the big single complaint from a small business owner's perspective is A, it takes you too long to get there. B, you're always got their, you always have your hand in their pocket because something's always breaking. So it, it's, it's a love hate. They need you. They don't like paying you. It's because the business alignment's not right. So the other key thing to getting into managed services is increasing your technical util, utilization rate. And the average is 50%, who knows? I don't know what that is, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's a sizable increase from where most utilization rates are now, right? Um, which segues nicely into the economy of scale. And this is a Gartner and a Forrester stat. Look at it this way. Just meaning if you're an M, if you're an IT support resource right now and you have two engineers, those two engineers can manage about 250 endpoints and they're at capacity. If you want to bring on any more clients, you got to bring on more resources. If you put remote monitoring and management in place, like Packet Trap, I had to do that little shameless plug, the the scale, the economy of scale jumps to 325. And that's not me pitching that to you guys. That's an industry stat. Once you have your clients under a automated method of management and you've You've got real metrics streaming over the net, and you've got it all on a central dashboard. Your engineers now have an economy of scale, which means you have economy of scale, which means you could bring on those extra clients and never hire another engineer. Right? So, break for today, manage service tomorrow. What are you waiting for? You got to get, you know, you got to really think about what you need to do. So, some of the issues. Why managed services? We, we've talked about why managed services, but what you guys really have to avoid is a commoditization in the SMB space. And, you know, I've jumped in on a few of the MSP mentor, you know, blogs, 
you know, when there's comment strings about, well, everything's already a commodity, da 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 We know that AV is a commodity, right? You're not going to sell AV for what you sold AV for 10 years ago. And backup BNR, back fast recovery, that's becoming a commodity because of things like Modi and all the online stuff that small business, ex- uh, small business clients are exposed to. Everything that's a commodity, you guys got to avoid. And that's why differentiating your services is key. Right? And that's why avoiding the per device pricing from my perspective, because at the end of the day, if you're talk if your biggest hang up is talking about price, you're not talking about business content. You're not talking about ROI, uptime, you know, cost of ownership, life cycle management. You're not talking about all those questions that should really be answered from your clients when you're in a sales environment, rather than debating on how much it is per server to manage them. Right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much you're charging per server. The real cost is really, Mr. or Mrs. Small Business Owner, how much I'm charging for my services for 30 seconds. Can you honestly answer me how much it would cost if I snuck in snuck in your offices this morning and unplugged the server? What would it cost you per hour for you staff not to have access to any information? And I'm sure you may or may not have that question, but you know another factor to think about is if you're even a garage, a mechanics, or whatever, you name the business, if I were to go in and erase every client record and bug in there that just, or sent every client record to a third party in some other country and I stole everything, how much would that cost you? Those are questions you guys should be spending most of the cycles talking about rather than how much per server. So, you know, that's just a sales 101. You got to really think of ways and learn methodology of driving the conversation to areas that you need to really start thinking about other than making a total technical business related decision based on price. So, you know, you have to be able to determine what your your clients are looking for, what they what their understanding is for your new service, and that's developing a really interesting not elevator pitch because I can't stand that word, but understanding what your positioning statement is going to be. And a positioning statement could be something as simple as, "Mary Frank, thanks for having me over. As you know, I work with tons of companies that you know are struggling." with managing their infrastructure like you guys are. And what we do is we help them understand the risks and benefits of moving to a more structured environment. You know, we work with a lot of companies that have the same challenges you do. And at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do is, you know, talk to you and waste your time about services you may or may not need. So without any further ado, you know, if you have any more questions for me, I'd like to sort of dive in to understand what happens, you know, if I were to unplug your service. And great positioning statement because, you know, nor did I talk price. I also told them that I don't want to waste their time, which really means I don't want to waste my time. And I've positioned it properly. So, you know, I, I can I can dance around that conversation for at least 20 minutes without getting into pricing. And within that 20 minutes, I'm going to be able to extract tons of cool information about what happens when, you know, Bridget clicks send on an email from a mortgage quote that goes through, you know, Juris, which goes through LoanLender.com, which goes through all kinds of cool things. And then I'm going to find out what happens when Phyllis, you know, spilt coffee on her laptop and she lost X, Y, Z number of files, which were huge because she's the coordinator. So those are the things you want to know, right? So you got to avoid the commodity trap, which is a huge, I should have just renamed this slide, but I think we can deal with that. Okay, right. I've gone through most of the, the, the stuff I wanted to talk about. So I'm going back to a shameless plug, but I think it's it, it's important to make note of um, did they all thing for tears, ad enabled, and I worked on their channel team, and then I spent the, the balance of my time in business consulting, doing similar to what like, Stuart Selbs and what Gary Pika does, been doing it for the software vendors. So I spent that time helping folks develop methodologies for getting over those hurdles, figuring out how to get through it. So what we've done here, and we've developed it about three years ago, and it's it's an amazing process. It's our MSP acceleration process because what it does is it takes 100% of the guesswork out of building price and selling your services without the pain and complexity of completely transforming your business. Like if you want to go to business this way and you had your heart set on going per device, we have methods of helping you get through that. But you know, from a holistic perspective, we have 
an entire marketing campaign in a box. We have fly sheets, we have everything you need, but the real meat and potatoes of the acceleration process is building your SLAs. Because getting to one of the points I made earlier, you guys are getting inundated with calls from Enable, Casale, Lab Tech, Level Platforms, GFI, us, and everyone else out there. Right? So when you go up and you finally buy one of those platforms, one of the big challenges that you thought you overcame was picking a software tool and then paying that nut every month. But that's, that's just the beginning. Reselling that tool. It's, you're buying a hammer from us. A is a straight transactional sale. You buy AV from Mackey or Panda or whomever, and you sell that. And if you want to slap a, a support service on top of it, it's pretty straightforward. But when you buy a remote monitoring and management tool, the same thing with a PSA. There's no transferable cost from a PSA. You can't pass that cost on. You can if you bake it into your SLAs, and we show you how to do that. But primarily speaking, with the RM tool, you don't resell that. You don't go sell the monitoring. You're not selling OnStar for a GM car, right? So it's like the classic example would be it's like a, it's like a power tool to a contractor. So when the contractor is talking to someone and they're going to build them a house, a deck, or a, a deck, whatever, you know, they're not talking about, well, my Ryobi or my Delta is going to do this. They're talking about the service they're going to provide to them. So regardless as to what RMM product you guys are using or you guys are going to be using, you're not selling that. So you got to find out how to bake that into your SLA. Because if you start a sales call with your small business clients talking about technology and this and that and widgets and exchange store file size and active directory, their ears are bleeding. You know, so our acceleration process takes 100% of the guesswork out of that completely. And um, from that perspective, I uh, should have let that one slide. Yep, with that, go. Um, so from our perspective, what we've done is by adding the PSA to the RMM component, what we've done is we've given you guys a complete 60 web acceleration process to sort of get you through you know, the, the key hurdles and if struggling in break fix, we can get you into managed services. So that's basically the gist of presentation. At that point, Michael, I'll pass it back over to you. And I want to thank you guys for all of your time. And we're going to open this up to the Q&A point at this point. But um, um, I'm going to slide this over to Mike, and we can sort of take it from there. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Mike. And. Cool. Uh, so I wanted just to say, Michael, that, that's some great information, and uh, we appreciate that overview. There are a couple of questions um, that came in, and you did touch on some of these things as well. Uh, but I just want to see if any additional things to add here first. Um, you were talking a lot about sales and marketing tips that you, because uh, I guess of your personal experience back in there, but if these people become a partner, are there classes or materials that you'll give out through the program for like sales and marketing training? Absolutely. Um Okay, the acceleration process work is assigned a dedicated partner management resource. So the partner management resource works you it's 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 a call base where you guys have a call, you sort of flush out the very first part is determining what what you want to do, and then there's three components to go through. This is supporting webinars that our partners are have access to, some of which are recorded, some are live. We have peer group sessions where we work with them. You know, on on sales roundtables, we have uh, downtime calculators, we have ROI calculators, and when I'm referring to downtime calculators and ROI calculators, I'm talking to the type of Excel-based tools that you can walk your end users, your clients through by saying, okay, so let's go to that question I asked you before. If I unplug your server, how much is it going to cost you per hour? Well, let's just take a look at the soft cost. You have two people, they're all making, what, 50 grand a year, 60 grand a year? You plug those numbers in, it tells them exactly how much per hour they're paying their staff. And a total cost, and then you start adding what the percentage is. And we have all those tools. We have all the marketing slicks. So I guess the short answer would be yes, but I'm really bad at Mike for giving short answers. <laughs> no worries. Long is good. Long is good. Okay, how do you sell – next question. How do you sell MDS to businesses with uh, with their own IT departments? Great one. And I think I have about four or five MSPs that have made – a phenomenal living doing that. Um, we got to go back to the to the very positioning 
step. So from a positioning statement, everyone has to be 100% aware of the fact that those IT people are typically your conduit in, internally, unless you're dealing with the CFO or someone else. But nine times out of 10, your conduit to that company is through the IT person. So they're 100% aware of the threat you pose from an outsourced perspective, right? So the way you want to position that is, hey, you know, we work with a lot of large companies like you guys who are struggling with managing the corporate infrastructure as well as, you know, fighting for budget and head Count. So what we do is we specialize in outsourced IT management for you guys. Like bring out your network debt. What is are eating up the most amount of your cycles that you can't get headcount for? Because we can do after hour support, after you know, we could do exchange, we could do core network working, we could do end user support. What you have to do is flush out what areas of expertise you have, prioritize them, right? Like come up with nice consumable packages. And this is something which it sort of goes against the grain, but it's a different attack process because anyone who doesn't have an IT staff, it's a pretty straightforward sales pitch. People who have an IT staff, it's kind of into more of a, a symbiotic helping hand. How can I help you help? You know, your your you know, you guys look better within the core environment. Um, the challenge with those people is, at SP, you guys are great at you know promoting what you do. I haven't, unless you're selling software, unless you guys have sold a lot of software, I would stay really far away from trying to resell the monitoring solution. In other words, I personally, I might, because I've been in the, the managed services software game for almost years, I might hit an IT guy with that, but you're into the, the solar winds realm. So now you're selling a monitoring solution to an IT shop. I would stay away from that perspective, and I would take it from the approach of the helping hand because, you know, a key director feels a lot more comfortable loading his after-hour support or his, you know, his exchange support or backup to source his company, you know, he, you know, he feels he can work with you. But, you know, if you go down the, the slippery slope of a technical sales process, you guys have to have all the right you know, information, you have to have the competitive information because they're going to say, well, how does your product stack up against X? And then just a quagmire, right? And then you're going to go back to the, to the, so if it's us, you're going to hit us, hey, do you have a, how do you guys stack up against solar winds or what's up gold or da, 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 da. And then, you know, typically those aren't players in our space because very few of you guys are using what's up gold and solar winds or Tivoli or OpenView. So we don't have that on hand. And then it's just a, it's a it's a sales it's a single sales cycle, and for the most part, I think personally, a lot of MSPs aren't as equipped as software sales guys. So the approach per for larger companies that have internal IT staff is a supplemental door where it's you know bring out your dead, I'm a helping hand, let me in, let me help you any way you want to let me. So that's the way that I've seen guys really leverage that effectively. Oh, that's question ask uh what are the most popular packet trap services uh, i guess it's, well i'll answer it both ways uh, i have the luxury of talking directly to the person who asked the question so that be taken two ways right so is that selling an msp the software or is that the msp selling the end user the software so i'll take the first approach us selling you the software so well, tagline I think every uh, you know packet trap sales guy has pitched at every show we've ever been at is, hey, we're comparable to all the rest of the folks on desktops and servers. You know, same thing. We do scripting. We have all the integration paths with all the other PSA vendors. But really, separate from the pack is you have to look at where packet trap got its start from. Really, so if you go back six years, packet trap started not in the MSP space. It was competing in solar ends. So. We do network traffic analysis. We do web surf analysis. We have full VoIP support. You can do MOS, call editors, call quality, call manager. So the peripheral component of the network peripheral, sorry, uh, component of packet trap is, is really powerful and clearly differentiates and sets us apart from the pack. Now, how does that say and transcend from your sales process to your clients? It's more of, but you know, like, uh, okay, let me 
take two back. Okay, here we go. So from from a sales perspective, if I was an MSP working, or if I was working with any of you guys, and you were using Packet Trap MSP, and wanted to be able to highlight within down the monitoring path, some of the value propositions associated to your bronze, silver, or gold, my point there would be, uh, one of the cool and interesting components of our solution is we're using, and I won't get into much detail, Jane or Bob or Hank, because I know you know it's stuff that we've spent hours evaluating and buying, but we have some really interesting tools that we've baked into our SLAs, like our bronze, silver, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, one of them that in all of our service offerings is our management process allows us to be able to provide you as a business owner with a who's who hit parade of web surf analysis. What that means is, is you're going to get a report, you know, weekly, monthly, daily, whenever you want it, however often you want it, on how much time your staff spending on specific websites like Facebook, you know, Hulu, Netflix, Pandora, dating sites, whatever. And heaven forbid there's other nefarious websites that they're surfing that you do need to know from an HR perspective. So that's something that's really interesting from, you know, SLAs versus some of the other competitors in the industry, uh, folks. So we do a complete analysis of all the traffic. We can actually give you who's surfing what. Uh, some of the other interesting components about our, which is, you know, in all our SLAs, what we can also do is we can also report on the VoIP systems you're using in here. So from, you know, because I know a lot of the stuff you're using, you've got some stuff up in the cloud, you've got some virtual desktops, you've got all this stuff, which is putting a huge strain on on the bandwidth. So you guys are complaining heavily that, you know, you just brought in Salesforce and it's really sluggish at times. And what we do is we can pinpoint all those areas within your environment that are causing that latency. Because if you take two steps back, back to me, that's about maybe 100 hours of downtime you're experiencing a week, Bob. That's what I'm always going to roll the rise and say 100 hours a week, sure. And then I'd say, well, you got 35 people, and every time they're clicking the advance button on Salesforce, it's spinning for you know five to six seconds. You multiply that by how many times do they click an hour times how many days they're working a week times how many people are working, there's your hours. You know what I mean? So those are some of the interesting factors of our software. I could go into, you know, management. I can go into scripting. I can go into all the different things that our software does. But um, I think more importantly for whomever asked that question, it's important to put the business spin rather than the, the bin bites as to what the software does. So we have time for just one more question. And that is, is there any cost to get into the program? Um. Cost of admission for our software is, you know, obviously, I'm not, we get into the pricing, of, you know, every, please contact us here if you want pricing information, but the acceleration process specifically is, is in for free. Uh, and one thing I didn't mention is once you become a partner and own our software, whether you own the PSA or the, the monitoring solution, Packet Trap MSP, you have access to a partner management resource. Right, and dedicated body is your account manager until you complete the program. Then you're moved into the channel team because I recreated the channel team here. So you have a dedicated resource in staff that's going to walk you through all the go market. You know, if you want a person to come out in market with you, you that person can come out in market with you, help you sell what you used to do. So you have access to all the post sales support and resources at no additional cost. So from from your perspective, your only cost to having access to all of the the support of the the help developing your SLAs and executing them is part and parcel of the price of admission for the software. Oh, hey, great, great, great stuff today, Mike. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, I think that's going to wrap us up. Now we're just coming up to the uh, the hard stop at the hour here. Mike, I want to thank you very much for uh, sharing all this information today about Quest and the different programs and offerings. And uh, I'll let everyone know that we will uh, be able to respond to everyone with a link uh, for uh, available on demand later. It's going to take usually takes a few days for that to get all cooked up and posted online, but we will follow up with an email. And Mike, if folks have more um, questions and they want to direct it towards the team at Quest. I'm looking at your last slide here. You've got sales at packettrap.com or you can go online to packettrap.com. Mike, do you have a parting words for us before folks take off for the day? 
Hey, I really appreciate, you know, everyone, you guys for hosting this, and I really appreciate everyone's time because, again, exactly how busy you guys are. So thanks again for showing up, and all of us, happy selling. Great. All right, thanks, everyone. That wraps us up today. Again, this is Michael Siggins from Channel Pro Magazine. We greatly appreciate you folks joining us today. We're going to terminate uh, the program here. I want to wish everybody a great day and happy selling. Thank you.